Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Welcome to the show. I'm Lisa Williams. Today's guest is an icon in history. I'm honored to introduce Kathy Hughes. Miss Hughes got pregnant when she was 16, and back then her friends said her life was over. Her mother kicked her out of the house, and she was shocked. Miss Hughes said pregnancy was the beginning. The birth of her son was the reason she took her life seriously for the first time as a teenager and made a promise to herself, to her son, and to God that she would not become a black statistic. But she did end up becoming a statistic. Kathy Hughes started the largest African-American-owned and operated broadcast company in the U.S. and became the first African-American woman to head a publicly traded company. Miss Hughes's rise from teen mom to media mogul didn't come easy. Working her way up at the Howard University radio station in the 1970s, Miss Hughes had the opportunity in 1979 to buy a radio station with her husband. When they separated within a year, the business tumbled, and unfortunately, she lost her home, but refused to give up her company. Miss Hughes and her son slept on the floor of the radio station until she finally turned the business around. Determined to build an empire, 32 different banks, all men, turned down Miss Hughes' request for a loan. But the 33rd banker, a Hispanic woman, said yes. And with that million dollars... Mrs. Hughes's career as an owner and operator of radio stations began in earnest. In 1977, Miss Hughes stepped down as CEO of Radio One, a position taken over by her son, Alfred Charles Liggins III. And Miss Hughes is now board chair and secretary of the company. In 1999, Radio One went public, its IPO earning $172 million. Between 1999 and 2000, Radio One purchased 35 radio stations from 10 different owners in major markets and transformed the company into a national media powerhouse. In 2015, Radio One bought out Comcast's minority interest in TV One and became the only African-American-owned cable television network in the country. Miss Hughes has received hundreds of prestigious awards and recognitions from Lifetime Achievement Awards to being inducted into the American Advertising Federation Hall of Fame. One of her highest recognitions was the corner of 4th and 8th Street in Washington, D.C., being named the Kathy Hughes Corner in her honor. Miss Hughes is highly active in philanthropic work and is a champion for the hungry and homeless, a mentor to countless women, and an advocate dedicated to empowering minority communities. Please welcome to the show. Kathy Hughes. Lisa, I'm telling you, I need to hire you, take you on the road with me to do my introductions. Thank you, my sister. That was beautiful. We're glad to have you. Well, let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about the growing number of Black women in business, how we've evolved, and what it'll take to help African-American women in business run successful businesses. Let's get started. Black women have always had an entrepreneurial spirit. From our great-grandmothers who cleaned houses for a living and sold fish dinners at churches, to the many African-American women who rose to the tops of their industries, including Michelle Obama, the first African-American first lady of the United States, Sheila C. Johnson, founder of BET, becoming the first African-American woman billionaire, Oprah Winfrey, having the number one daytime talk show in America, Serena Williams, number one in women's singles tennis. Janice Bryant, owner of the largest minority woman-owned employment agency in the United States. And Ursula Burns, the first African-American woman CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And of course, the list goes on and on. In fact, according to the 2015 State of Women-Owned Business Report, the number of women-owned businesses grew by 74% between 1997 and 2015. The report also stated that 33% of women-owned firms are owned by minority women, and black females are amongst the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in the U.S. It's wonderful to know that African-American women entrepreneurs are the fastest growing segment 
of entrepreneurs in the U.S. What a great statistic. So it's important that we don't let this momentum die. Now, more than ever, African-American women entrepreneurs need resources available to help them not just be in business, but grow in business. The biggest hurdle African-American women business owners face is that many are first-generation entrepreneurs, and they lack exposure to other Black women in business that have successful businesses from which they can glean habits and proven processes from. Let's look at an example of just how important having a role model accessible to you can be. Here is what Jessica Alba, actress and CEO of The Honest Company, said about having someone that you can call on. As far as mentors go, countless. I was not shy about making phone calls to many people. I've been fortunate enough to know people like Tori Birch and Diane von Furstenberg, and they, you know, got lots of emails and phone calls from me along the way with tears in my eyes saying, I don't know if this is possible. Why is everyone telling me no? What do I do? What does it even mean to get venture capital? What is venture capital? What's a board? Like, I just didn't know all these business terms. And so they helped me understand it. And it's nice having women that you can look to and rely on. Incidentally, her husband, Cash Warren, a Yale graduate, producer, and tech investor, introduced Jessica to his childhood friend, Brian Lee, an entrepreneur who co-founded LegalZoom. And the women Jessica reached out to, Tori Birch, who is a New York fashion designer, and Diane von Furstenberg, who is a billion-dollar fashion designer. Unfortunately, most African-American women don't have the same access and connections that Jessica Alba was blessed with. Black female entrepreneurs need a supportive network of African-American women business owners that we can learn from. It's time to talk, share, and provide resources and roadmaps to Black women in business. We need successful mentors to inspire African-American women on their journey in business. I have lined up a variety of successful, prominent, and leading African-American women in business across many industries to share their paths and secrets to their success. They will discuss their journey not only as women in business, but more importantly, how they grew successful businesses in spite of the unique challenges faced by African-American women business owners. Forgive my cloudy voice, but the show must go on. So let's get into the show. Well, tell me this, Ms. Hughes. How do you feel being a part of this historical time currently for African-American women in business? I think that, that the economy has uh, done um, entrepreneurs a big favor because when you know you know how to do something, when you know you have the credentials to do something, you know you have an idea that you know will work, but yet you can't find a job, you can't find a paycheck, uh, then the option number two, game plan number two, is for you to work for yourself. And I think that you see, you know, the numbers just skyrocketing, particularly with women and uh, women of color, because it's the smart thing to do, but because of the economy, we've been pushed into it. And so I'm just really thankful that in my lifetime I've witnessed so many women working for themselves in so many diverse uh, disciplines and fields. Absolutely. So a good story isn't a good story until we can understand where you started. Can you kind of go back and uh, the intro probably didn't do it justice. Can you kind of go back and tell me where you started, Ms. Hughes? Well, like I said, I started working first in my grandfather's school. I was typing 110 words a minute and doing shorthand at 150 words a minute by the time I was 10 years old. And my father, when he opened up his, my father was the first black CPA to graduate from Creighton University, and I was so honored because 50 years to the day that he became their first black graduate, they gave me an honorary degree in his honor. But he opened uh, an accounting firm, and I filled out tax forms, and um, uh, Prentice Hall um, was the uh, book that kept you up to date on our, of the IRS regulations, and that was my responsibility when I was in junior high school and high school. So I grew up in a business environment. My family never, 
They encouraged us to get education so we would know how to run our own businesses. Uh, one of the things, one of my favorite lectures that I give when I'm invited to speak at various places is that one of the mistakes I think that uh, the black uh, family has made with the education of our children is that we, you know, have viewed education as a passport to getting, quote, a good job. And when you look at a, um, you know, um, uh, Dick Parsons, or you look at these uh, individuals who have headed major corporations uh, in America, that's what generations, prior generations were encouraged to do. Get a good education. Apply yourself. Be the best. You know, the, the um, head of uh, the Carnival Cruise Line, Arnold Donald, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. The president of Ben and Jerry's, a brother. So many um, uh, distinguished, the head of Xerox, a sister. So many distinguished black people. Can you imagine, though, if that had been our own company? Why can't we own Carnival uh, Cruise Lines? Why can't we own American Express? Why can't we own uh, Time, AOL, Time Warner? Yet uh, we have progressed to the point where we know how to run them, so why can't we do it for ourselves? I agree. And, you know, I think we're moving in that direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So I'm really happy that, um, you know, the economy I don't care what has caused us to do it. We we have, for the first time, been unafraid to venture out on our own. I have to give the hip-hop generation a lot of credit for that also because they created different industries. Um, they got into fashion because they realized how uh, much money they were spending. But, I mean, you know, businesses that have just fascinated me. We have a young man. He must be about 32, 33 now. He has two big pickup trucks that have these gigantic containers that hold water and hoses, and he goes around to various corporations, including ours, washing cars. Uh And he charges $25 a car, and on the days that he comes to us, the biggest argument is who gets in line with their car first to get their car washed. He he can't service all of our cars on just one day, and usually on the second day, some of the people who got their cars washed the last time are arguing with other folks saying, you had your car washed two days ago. Mine hasn't been washed since last week. Again, a hip-hop kid who saw a way to generate revenue for himself, he employs like 14 people with this car wash that's nothing more than these gigantic containers of water on the back of a pickup truck and the tools, the rags and things he needs. Young people, the grill. Who would have thought that the the grills would have been a multi-million dollar business? Whoever would have thought that putting diamonds, okay, an attachment to your teeth with diamonds in it would generate the type of money it has for young people. So I'm real proud of the millennials who have taken the challenge of, I'm going to get my education, but it's not to make somebody else rich. It's to start my own company company to employ uh, people, people who hopefully look just like me, and to be a success for myself and for my family, not to help some other corporations survive and thrive and make a big profit. That's right. And, and being creative and doing something they enjoy. Yes. Yes, doing something that you love. It's kind of like what Michael Jordan said. He was surprised they would pay him to play basketball because that's how much he loved it. Okay, when you're you're doing something, you know, people like to write about my um, uh, background is challenging and I faced all these obstacles. Uh Uh-uh. I was having fun. I enjoyed every single solitary day. Yes, I had some obstacles placed in my path. I had some challenges, but they weren't painful. In fact, it would, I felt so elated when I could figure out a problem, how to get around something that I needed to, how to resolve something, how to move to the next level, because I love the communications industry. So, you know, the fact that God has, has, uh, it able me to make money doing it. I'm like Michael Jordan. Wow, are they going to pay you too? That's <laughs> the icing on the cake. <laughs> yes, that's the icing on the cake. Yeah, icing on the cake. It's a whole cake and a bag of chips. <laughs> that's right. That is right. Well, Miss Hughes, tell us if you if you will, what was a day like um, as you were in your day to day operations of building your business? 
Oh, every day was different. That's one of the beautiful things about the telecommunications industry. No two days are alike. They were long. They still are sometimes very long, um, but uh, very rewarding. Um, nothing, nothing, as I said, gives me uh, greater satisfaction and gratification than helping someone. And, you know, now that, you know, I've been in this business, my company's 35 years old now, so I have seen children be born, grown, graduated from college, and have their own children now. To know that you were responsible for the braces that went on their teeth, you were responsible for them to be uh, being able to go off to the college that they wanted, you were responsible for their first car, that's the greatest gratification, satisfaction, elated feeling that I can possibly describe. I love the fact that my career has, I've been able to use it to empower other individuals to obtain and achieve their goals and dreams in life. Yes, what a wonderful contribution. So as an African-American woman in business, let's talk about what your path has been like as you navigated your entrepreneurial ship. So obviously you came from a family of entrepreneurs, but what can you share with African-American women business owners about starting, staying, and sticking it through to reach a level of success in their business? Well, you know, I think you used the right word. The operative word in what you just said is stick with it. Uh, It's so easy in contemporary society to give up. People give up on relationships. They give up on how they want to look. They give up on, you know, uh, how many, I mean, the diet uh, industry is one of the biggest in the country because everyone stops, and then they go back and start again. And and so, you know, business isn't something that you can start and stop at will unless you're Donald Trump. But, okay, he's not <laughs> doing that, okay. But that's not a path I'd recommend to a woman of color in particular. But the key, I really think, is not to give up. I remember once having a very high-profile celebrity guest on my show, and the day he was on, it was his 40th wedding anniversary. And I said to him, he wished his wife, you know, happy birthday, and I said, what's the secret? Here you are, high-profile in all the magazines, newspapers, and everything. How have you made your marriage work? He said, My wife and I agreed when we got married we would never give up. No matter what the challenge was, we would not give up. And he said, here we are 40 years later. We still have challenges, but we're still committed to not giving up. That's the mindset you have to have to be a successful entrepreneur. That's wisdom. So, Ms. Hughes, what was hard for you? I mean, honestly, think of one of the most challenging times in your business. What was really hard for you, and how did you get past that challenge? I never saw any of it as hard. I saw it all as a challenge and an opportunity to grow. Never saw it as hard. If you see it as hard, guess what? That's what it is. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> okay. If you see it as that's what you got to do. Can you imagine the discipline, how hard it is on an athlete every day, to on their bodies? A dancer. Look at Misty Copeland. To, to see her stay in the condition that she has to be in so that she doesn't break her neck doing the things that she's able to do or break her foot off at the ankle, that, but that's not hard to her. It's rewarding. It's invigorating. That's the same way business is for me. Okay, it may look hard to someone who's not doing it, but I never saw it as hard because if you think of it as hard, then guess what? That's when you're tempted to throw in the towel and give it up. That's when you don't get to celebrate. You know, we just turned 35 uh, years old last year. This would be our 36th year this year, uh, having gone in business in 1980. You start seeing it as hard and it's a struggle and I'm tired and woe is me. At some point, you're going to say, I can't take this anymore, particularly with businesses that, that, you know, have generated some success All businesses go through cycles. You have good times and you have bad times. Being in business is not always a straight-up projectile. Sometimes you drop down in a valley so low you can't see light. Uh There is no light at the end of that tunnel. And those are the times when you have to call upon your God and your God-given inner strength to know that it's a cycle. Nothing stays forever. This, too, shall pass away. This did not come to stay. Yes, indeed. This too shall pass. Yes, absolutely. And that's good times and bad times. That's true. 
I think that's, you know, that's you don't stay on top forever either. You know, you don't stay on top forever. And believe me, it's harder to maintain success than it is to achieve success. Because sometimes, you know, you, you ignore the challenges. Like I said, to me, it was never hard. It was challenging. It was fulfilling. It was invigorating. But sometimes when you get to a certain point where you are generating a profit in a business, you are generating revenue, it's kind of easy to sit on your laurels. Just to say, well, you know, I'm going to play golf or I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, you know, take it easy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right, a two, three, four, five-year vacation. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, whatever happened to her and her business? She was doing so good at one time. Sure, sure. Yeah. She took a break. That's what happened. Or he took a break. You can't do that in business because there will be up cycles and there will also be down cycles. What goes up? has to come down at some point. Getting it back up, like I said, oftentimes it's easier than keeping it up there for a prolonged period. All right. So we have many, many black women that have accomplished great successes as yourself. Um, as I, don't as see my, I don't see myself, Lisa, as successful. I see really? myself as a work in progress. To me, America has the wrong definition of success. To me, success should be judged the day you close your eyes. You, it should be determined then whether or not your life made a difference in the lives of others, not just in your life, but yes. did you, in fact, help more people than you hurt along your path? And if the answer to that question is yes, then in my opinion, you are successful. I don't, I don't consider myself nor my company successful. I consider us a work in progress towards success. But, Ms. Hughes, you know you have impacted and helped the lives of people within this 35 years. You can't give yourself that credit I don't deny right that. now? I don't deny that, but I don't okay. consider that success. I consider that the mission. I consider that the journey, not the destination. To me, success is the destination. Awesome. I'm still on the journey. Wow. Well, I'm still, I don't, want, I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop impacting. I don't. I feel so blessed that after all these years in radio, <laughs> ten years ago, I got the opportunity to start learning cable television, and then five. Six years ago, I got the opportunity to start learning the Internet. I'm loving when I'm learning about social media and millennials right now. So I see it still as a growth and a learning process for me and my company. Very nice. That's, uh, that's some great insight. People should turn their thinking. Well, I don't know if they should turn their thinking so much as that's just how I view it. You know, the more people I'm able to employ, the happier uh, I am with the decision I've made to pursue certain entrepreneurial ventures because it provides employment. Like I said, I love when, you know, my employees, you know, um, uh, children grow up and come back and say, oh, Miss Hughes, I remember when I was five years old and I came to the Thanksgiving dinner and you fed me turkey and you didn't know that my mother didn't believe that we should eat turkey and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, and I had, this is my daughter and I let her eat turkey. You know, it's it's just rewarding to watch a generational progression taking place. Yes, absolutely. So can you share a nugget to help women that are just starting a business? Yes, I certainly can. You have to keep your eye on the prize, and you got to keep both eyes on the prize. One of the things that I'm a faster, and when um, you learn to fast, people tell you don't share it with everyone because the first thing that happens, people who love you and really care about you start telling you, oh, you could do damage to your heart. You could do damage to your lungs because it's not something that they do. One of the things with business is when you're starting, all businesses are a struggle to start. If, business, if being an entrepreneur was easy, everybody would be an entrepreneur. Okay, it's, okay, it's not an easy thing. Some people are more adept at adjusting to the rigors of it. Um, and are, you know, more disciplined about it than others, but it's not easy for anyone. And so often, you know, to say, how how you doing? Oh, business is slow. Oh, my goodness, you know, I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not getting this. I just lost that contract. And 
a well-meaning mother, a well-meaning best friend, a well-meaning mate will say, you might need to stop that and go get a good job. You're putting in 14, 18 hours a day. You're not making any money. Why do you keep doing this? you got all these qualifications. Why don't you just go get a good job? You have to keep your eye on the prize and you have to eyes on the prize and you have to be very careful about who you share the challenges that are confronting you with because very well-meaning, loving people will give you the worst advice and that advice usually is throw in the towel, give it up, it's not worth the effort. Well, they can't determine whether or not it's worth the effort for you, but they encourage you to take your eyes off the prize, and the minute you do, you're dead in the water. So my advice is keep your challenges close to your heart and yourself. Talk to mentors of people who have been through them like yourself, but be very careful how you share the hard times that you and all businesses go through with other individuals because in their loving care for you, they can give you some of the worst advice. My mother, for about a four-month period, wouldn't even speak to me because I would not give up on my first little 1,000-watt AM station and go get a government job. She said, you know, I'm, I can't believe that you're being so pig-headed. You're just going to crash and burn the way you're sleeping on the floor in a sleeping bag. you got your child living in a radio station. It's like you've had a nervous breakdown or something, Kathy. Go get a government job. You'll have security. You'll have benefits. Stop doing what you're doing. It's not working. Now, if she, she didn't tell me that because she didn't think I could pull it off. She didn't like seeing me suffer. She she said that to me in love, out of love. She, you know, she was, she didn't want to see me going through this. But it was the worst advice she could have given me. Can you imagine if I had listened? Can you imagine <laughs> if you would have listened? <laughs> I can't imagine. I'm okay. so glad you didn't listen to your mom. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> right. I would have been a government retiree with a pension. Okay, yep. trying to figure out could I afford a ticket to get to Chicago. <laughs> I would have been a what Expedia somewhere looking for a discount. Okay. <laughs> oh gosh, it's true. Okay. I mean, what you're sharing is so real, and, yes. and the experience of so many, especially African American uh, people in general. Yes, absolutely. And like I said, they do it in love. Now, some people do it in viciousness. Okay, now I'm not saying that everybody who tells you to give up is doing it out of love. There's some people who don't want to see you succeed. Sure, okay, sure. and so they're like, girl, if I were you, <laughs> okay, well, guess what? You're not me, all right, and you don't have the same goals and desires, so keep your eyes on the prize and be careful about who you talk to. All right. Now, let, let's have a little fun. If you okay. could share something with your younger self, Miss Hughes, let's say 15 years ago about being in business, what would it be? I'd have to go back further than 15 years ago based on my age. If okay. I could go back to my 20s and 30s, I would have more than one child. My son has done such an incredible job of embracing my vision and forwarding my company. I'm just sorry that I didn't have twins or at least have four or five more to work in the company. If mm -hmm. I could go back to my childbearing years, I thought about adopting but I had mastered being a single parent with just the one child, so I selfishly made the decision that he and I could make it, but I didn't know if I could make it with him and a brother or a sister. You know, there would be three of us, and the two of us could make it. If I had to do over, the only thing I would change about my life is I would have more children. Oh, that's nice. And, ho and hopefully uh, at least one or two others would join him in the company because now that the company is this size, my goodness, how wonderful it would be for him to be able to have siblings who also grew up in the business and could be of assistance. Sure, sure. So, yeah, that's the only thing that I would uh, actually uh, change. Uh, other than that, um, I, in the, in the blink of my eyes, would do it all over the same way. Very nice. 
So as I explained in the introduction, one of the greatest challenges African-American women face in business is the lack of successful African-American women role models in our communities. So let's now talk specifically about the unique challenges African-American women in business face. And I'm going to uh, name a couple of different uh, topics, and if you could let me know which one you might want to share a nugget or two um, that you either dealt with, had to get past, or had some experience with, um, we greatly appreciate your input. So uh, one of the areas um, specific to African-American women uh, business owners and, and challenges within our community is that they didn't understand uh, the family. The family didn't understand the entrepreneurial walk, which you just mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, another is no role model to call on. Many African-American women don't have uh, very successful business owners, women, African-American women like themselves that they can actually reach and, and connect with. Um, lack of relationships because, you know, maybe your friends did not own a business and you do own a business. Um, another area is investing in ourselves. Typically, um, our culture, we don't go to personal development seminars. Um, volunteering is a big one, and, and you spoke about that when you, um, your, your, uh, your father's business, uh, your father's school. Volunteering is not really typically taught in the African-American home other than what we do at church. So do any of those uh, jump out at you and you might want to speak to? All, all of the above. All, all of the above. I say to you that we don't need to look outside of the family, quite frankly, uh, for <laughs> role models. Most black mamas are the best role models that you could possibly come up with. Most of them figured out how to stretch a dollar into two. Um, yeah. Okay, they they did whatever was necessary to help their families, whether they had a husband or not. They still, even those uh, who were blessed to have husbands and fathers in the, um, the family, still had additional responsibility. Any black woman who can successfully educate, rear provide for her family can run a company. The same skill set that it takes to run a successful family is the same skill set that's transferable into business. We just don't see that. So, you know, um, when you talk about a Jessica Alba, you talk about Tory Burch, you talk about the, the White Woman Network, we have it, we just call it something different. Uh, you know, all right. Okay. I mean, the best role model any black woman could have right now is Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama. <laughs> okay. This girl did everything, including getting her man the number one job in America. Okay. That's Barack right. Obama could not be the president of the United States had he not had Michelle at, uh, right at his side. Okay. Right. Uh, sometimes in front of him, sometimes beside him, but also always having his back, okay, always giving him the advice that he needed to go all the way to the top. So, you know, you, you don't have to be able to just pick up the telephone. In this day of technology, you are blessed. You can Google it. Okay, you can have a conversation, uh, you can have an interactive conversation with anybody you so desire on the Internet now because just about all successful people have social networking going on, social media going on where you can have conversations. You can go in the chat room and find out things. So you don't necessarily have to know Oprah personally to benefit from the sage advice that she gives all the time. Oprah loves, Oprah is a griot. Oprah loves to share, uh, share stories of success with all women. And yeah. it's interesting to me, when I go through airports, I travel a lot. I see so many young white women with the magazine O. They, they, they read Oprah like she's their girlfriend, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. All right, because it, it doesn't matter to them that she's, African American. Every black woman in America should have a, have a subscription to Oprah. Okay, every black woman in America should be checking out what Michelle Obama is doing. Uh -huh. 
a, the best example of the total fulfillment of black womanhood is right there in front of us. And with technology, you don't have to have your next door neighbor being, you know, the president of a company or owning her own beauty parlor or whatever. Okay, I mean, some of the best paid sisters in our community, as quiet as it's kept, were the beauticians. All right. Okay, and sometimes they were our aunts and our and and those beauty parlors generated big revenue, put kids through school. So I think that labels are what help uh, hinder us from really identifying what we're looking for in terms of role models and information. Everything about everyone who's achieved anything in America is on the internet now. All you have to do is access it. If you can read, write and count in America, you can be a successful entrepreneur. Thank you for dispelling those myths. <laughs> you know, that's, and like I said, you know, some people may say, well, you know, they don't agree with it. But that's how I've lived my life. My mama was my role model. Yeah, Sometimes, too. Yeah, but now my mama told me that if I wanted to have a baby start a family, that I need to have my own roof. She said, you don't need to be under my roof if you're going to, okay, live the life of an adult. You're a grown woman. You want to have a baby? Okay, go out. Her her putting me out didn't mean she disassociated from me. She just meant, she forced me to have the financial responsibility of playing a grown person's game, which was being a parent. She would call me up every day. What are you cooking for dinner? You're giving him canned greens. You should be giving him fresh greens. She still wow. exerted the same level of pressure on me to be right and to be successful. She just made me pay my own rent. <laughs> okay? She wow. said I couldn't do it under her roof. Okay? Yeah. And to, and to this day, my son has not been allowed to sleep with anybody under my roof. Now, he can sleep with whomever he wants under a roof he pays for. But That's right. some of those old-fashioned, traditional African ways are uh-huh. very key in having a successful business because at their basis is the word respect, something that we don't hear a lot about anymore in our community. Respect, integrity, honesty, you know, being conscientious. These are words that previous generations grew up with. Accountability, you know, yes. Accountability, okay? And mm-hmm. now... Like I said, there's no excuse for anyone not having a role model. You can you can pretend you know Oprah like she's your next door neighbor just on the off the internet information that she provides willingly and graciously and generously every day of the week. Right. So now, some of the women that I've interviewed uh, did not grow up with entrepreneurs in their family, and so they spoke to how they felt that affected them or did not. How do you think growing up with entrepreneurs in your family um, helped with your business? It removed the fear because I had seen all the cycles. I think that when you don't grow up in an entrepreneurial, um, the, the worst part is the fear. Oh, my goodness, I thought I was doing so good. The bottom just fell out. Well, the bottom fell out of the economy, so naturally it's going to fall out of your business, but don't panic. Because it'll come back again. I think that the best benefit of growing up uh, with uh, in an entrepreneurial environment is that it takes the fear element out. Fear is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing to uh, have when you're trying to do anything that's new and different and innovative, creative. You know, I mean, and being an entrepreneur is that for the individual that, you know, it's not new to the world, but it's new to you and it's new to the industry that you're trying to forge your way into. And so uh, when you've witnessed your elders uh, going through it, when you've lived through it, then it removes that element of fear, which I think is the greatest benefit. Which I think that when, when you don't grow up in that environment, that's when you think that it's critical that, you know, you know Sheila Johnson or Oprah Winfrey or that somebody that can help you. Well, you know, as quiet as it's kept, Oprah and Sheila and uh, Shonda Rhimes, the rest of the successful women, they don't have a whole lot of time to help somebody else. They're trying to keep their venture alive and thriving and moving forward. Oprah works every day, okay? 
<laughs> right. <laughs> all right. So, you know, with all due respect, she helps as many people as she can, but her number one priority is keeping the old enterprise alive and well and prospering. Sure. Sure. So still trying to dig in and, and grab those nuggets from you. Um, what did you do when you did get stuck, overwhelmed, or ran out of money? None of the above did I do. Okay. I, I ran out of money um, um, <laughs> never. I just never uh, I, 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 uh, uh, allowed the times when I didn't have enough to satisfy all of my debt, okay, uh, overwhelm me. But I never ran out of money. I never stopped generating. Once I made the decision that I was going to generate revenue, sometimes it just wasn't enough. So one of the things that I teach in the business class, uh, at one time I was the AOL Time Warner uh, Endowed Chair for Howard University, and I would tell the students uh, the story of how if I owed you $10,000 for the month, and I couldn't make my $10,000 payment, I would send you what I have. Sometimes I'd send you a 1000 maybe I'd send you 5000 but I would send you something as a gesture of good faith. So every one of the people I owed money to knew that I was trying to live up to my word, but my cash flow was not commensurate with what I needed. But what that instilled in them was a confidence that when I did get all their money, that they were going to get it. Uh, one of the things we make, um, a mistake we make as entrepreneurs, when we can't pay a bill, we avoid the person we owe the money to. We don't take right. their calls. Or I was just the opposite. I would call you, tell you, listen, Lisa Williams, I'm sorry, I know you, I owe you $1,000. I only have 200 but I'm sending the 200 I know I owe you an additional $8. i am going to try to add it to next. Uh, month's payment, but right now I just want you to know that I am not ignoring my debt. And, and faith. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I faced, I accepted the responsibility. And so, you know, I, I never ran out of money. It was just many times it was not enough to satisfy all the people that I owed it to. Very good. And so instead of the money, I gave them my word. I gave them my integrity. I gave them confidence and comfort that they would get their money the minute it became available. And I worked diligently to make certain that it would increase and that I would not be in that position with uh, with them on a permanent basis. Sure. So what didn't you have when you were building your business that you wish you would have had in retrospect? Um, more children, <laughs> as I said earlier. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> more hours in the day. Um, more um, lending institutions. When I came into this business, banks weren't loaning money to radio, uh, to broadcasting facilities. They had not dis- – number one, they didn't understand the the most modern of radio stations, top not everything couldn't have any more than about $10 million in hard assets, yet that same station could sell for $100 million. They didn't understand the, you know, assignment of, of $90 million to goodwill. And so uh, I went into business prior to uh, major lenders having uh, telecommunications and broadcasting divisions that specialized in making money in my industry. That opened up maybe – didn't really open up for about 10 to 15 years into my um, career. Uh, I wish there I had had more individuals like the woman who loaned me the first million dollars who understood that this was an up-and-coming industry and that it was a wise investment. Um, I wish that uh, I had had more hours in the day because um, that was, you know, one of the biggest challenges was trying to get everything done in the amount of time, only 24 hours in a day for everyone. And uh, there were so many things that uh, I perhaps could have done better if I had had more time to dedicate to it. Sure. 
And and how did you keep your wherewithal, your mindset, knocking on 32 doors and being turned down uh, for funding? I needed a million dollars. It wouldn't keep my mindset. I was looking for the next address. (laughs) (laughs) Next. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Next. Uh, One of the things with my father being a CPA, I understood the law of averages. And, I again, this is something I teach my classes. (laughs) There's an old corny joke about a drunk who's standing on a corner talking to another drunk. And he says, yeah, you know, everyone who comes back here, by here, I ask her, I tell you, you sure are pretty, baby. I sure would like to go to bed with you. So the other drunk says, I bet you get slapped a whole bunch. He says, yeah, but I get a whole lot of play, too. The law of <laughs> averages, okay, means that everyone can't say no. And everyone I understood that. Everyone cannot say no. No, the law of averages means at some point you get a yes. And you got to stay alive. You got to keep the faith. You got to keep your eyes on the prize long enough to wait for that yes. In my case, it was 32 times I was turned down. 32 times I was slapped. But that 33rd time, I got to play. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and you got to check. <laughs> yeah, I got to check. The law of averages means that no number can stay the same indefinitely. You cannot stay. No matter how many no's you get, at some point a yes has to appear. Wonderful. Of averages, and I knew that because I was the daughter of a CPA. So I knew at some point that if I just kept, you know, working at it, that it was going to turn around. Someone was going to say yes. Then the concern is, do they say yes under the conditions and terms that you are agreeable to? Sure. Absolutely. But for sure, it's going to turn around and someone's going to say yes. Okay, so... Now, i got to complain about something a little bit here. I need you to help me out. Um, our black businessmen are showing us out. Tyler Perry has his homeless to success story, and Eric Thomas, the motivational hip-hop preacher, has his homeless to Ph.D. story. So us ladies, we've got to get our stories um, out and documented even more online and, and, you know, available. And so I ask you, what would you say your rags to riches story or your hero story is i don't know the answer to that question because like I said, that's not how i see it okay yeah, no, I, like i said that's other people write about me like it's a horatio alger story rags to riches no um i'm like nikki giovanni we were poor i didn't know it okay because we were right. happy okay <laughs> we were a happy family so uh yeah no i you know that that that's all good for those individuals uh, if that's how they care to view their you know rise to where they are. But that's not how I see mine. So, you know. well, well, could I say that your hero story is uh, from single mom to uh, million of uh, first woman ever millionaire to um, uh, sell a business? Or, or no, because, I, yeah, I, I don't. Listen, having my child was the turning point. That was the defining moment in my life, okay, as you uh, talked about in the introduction, okay, when God blessed me with that child, it was as if God had thumped me on the head and said, okay, now you got to be serious of purpose, <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, and I loved your analogy that I am a statistic, but I didn't want to be the wrong type of statistic. I didn't mind being, okay, that's correct. Correct. I didn't want to be having to go to a jail to visit my child, okay? I didn't want to have to do anything to compromise my integrity in order to feed my child. I didn't want to, okay? So, you know, um, I really, I see it differently, and I admire those folks who like to share that, you know, Oh, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I had a horrible life. All of us got some version of horrible if you black growing up in America. That's right. Okay, all right. It's Okay, I mean, millennials are getting gunned down by the police. Never in our history have people in authority been able to just kill us for no reason before. This is way worse than lynching. Lynchings occurred every now and then. Oh, Lord, they were horrible. No question about it. But now... It's the authorities that you call the police. You got to worry about are you in more danger from the authorities than you are from whoever is raping you, bothering you, beating you, robbing you, or whomever, okay? It's you might have a better side. 
Thank you. It's coming from every side. Never before in our history have we experienced that. Never before. Uh-huh. Not even during the times of slavery. These are the worst times in terms of our physical presence and existence and protection that we have ever lived through as a people. Mm. So true. And it's got to change. It has to. It has to. So switching directions for a moment, um, today there's a lot of talk about collaboration. What are your thoughts on collaboration instead of competition? I think that we do that. I think that, that, I think that it's a, a, a media myth that black women and women don't look out for each other. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, it's a myth that we don't support each other. I couldn't be who I am today had it not been for the support of black women who wanted to see me succeed as much as I wanted to succeed, and black men also, my community. You can't succeed by yourself. You just can't wake up one morning and decide that, oh, Lisa Williams is going to do a radio show and it's going to be, you know, an important outlet for people who, uh, you know, are entrepreneurs. You have to have other individuals who share your vision and say, we want to see Lisa Williams succeed. Yeah. It, it, it not only takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to propel, propel you into uh, uh, achievement, into success. It takes a collective effort. So this competition, you know, at one time they said, you know, well, uh, black women were competitive with, it, with each other over our men. Well, right now we ain't got to worry about each other. We got to worry about white females. Latino females, yep. Asian females, and even female impersonators want black men. Okay, so, okay. <laughs> all right. So this old myth that sisters don't like each other because we fighting over our men. Okay, <laughs> we fighting with everybody over a good everybody. black man in this day and time. Okay, so true, so true. Everybody. <laughs> yes, exactly. The black man is the most prized possession now. Okay, so, you know, I think it's a myth. I mean, every time um, I see my sisters um, who are, you know, uh, heading companies and running things, we embrace, we talk. I mean, Oprah and I would not, I would not consider Oprah a close personal friend, but if I called her today, Within at least 48 hours, she would get back to me, and if it was an easy day on her, she might get back to me today. And she and I aren't close. We don't hang. We don't, you know, but, okay, but the respect is there. Sisters really do support each other a hell of a lot more than we give, we get credit for or give ourselves credit for. We really do wish the best. We really are supportive. We really do in words for each other. And the fact that, you know, people, the common uh, conventional wisdom says that we don't, that's just another way of keeping us separated because when we, look how powerful our sororities have become. When we join together, ain't no stopping us. It's so true. And that's my experience as well. We are supportive of one another. Exactly. You know, when I got your request, I was like, oh, I'd be honored to do this sister show. Okay? Awesome. Thank you. You know, no, I mean it because, I mean, please, not only, you know, did I feel that it would help me, I felt it would help you, too. It's another guest. I, I, hey, I've been there, done that. When you're doing interviews and trying to uh, schedule people, it's the worst thing when I used to do um, a television show for TV One called One on One, I'd see somebody, consider them a friend, and they say, here, call this number, set it up. I call that number, I get the run around, okay, all right. I got a yes from them, but I, I know how hard it is to schedule interviews, okay? Yes it, is. yes, it is. All right, and sometimes it's just the person is busy, but the worst thing is for somebody to tell you they're going to do it and then refer you to one of their people, and their people give you the run around or ask you a thousand questions. I appreciated how you sent me an outline and a text of what you wanted to cover with me because you wanted me to be prepared. You know, I appreciate That's a sister looking out for a sister. You and I couldn't pick each other out of a lineup. No, we couldn't. Okay. But yet you were supported enough to want to tell my story, and I was supported enough to want to do it. Sisters help each other a lot more than we get credit for. I love it. 
And one of the things I share with business owners, especially women, is how they can succeed without having to compete. And yes. part of that, uh, as we spoke about earlier, is implementing the power of positioning and leveraging the media to build their brand and collaborating. All of that collectively helps grow a business so much quicker. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And what you're doing, giving exposure to, yeah, to my favorite uh, word. women entrepreneurs. Okay. I mean, exposure is so – you don't have to do this. I mean, in this day and time, again, you go on the Internet, you can come up with at least a 1,000 black women who have businesses that you could interview. Okay. And so each one of us that you bless – with your airtime, with sharing your position, empowers uh, the other, and we grow together. And and it's and, and I appreciate you saying that. This year, I said that I would launch my Grow by Giving campaign, and that is my heart for this project. Yes, I, I want my daughter and and other young girls, and and first women, obviously, that are in business. But hopefully these will be archived and people can access it. And not only can they hear the stories of all of you, but hear the passion as you speak about what you did yep. and how you did it. And I salute you for that. But who would describe that as you supporting black women? They would not. <laughs> okay. Probably not. Maybe. I don't know. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> that's not, okay. But yeah. that's, what it, that's what it is. Yeah, and I thank you. I thank you for doing that for me and my company and the countless others that you're doing it. My pleasure. So how do you think we can move forward and turn that growing number, that statistic I shared earlier of African-American women in business into successful million, multi-million, and billion-dollar businesses? By supporting each other, by doing mm-hmm. exactly what you're doing, by supporting each other, telling um, the story so often um, because of uh, individuals like yourself, the best thing is that you are doing an unwired network. You're hooking us up without really having to physically hook us up. You're making us aware of each other. And, you know, sometimes you might want something. You're like, you know what, I heard that. I heard a woman talking about doing that on Lisa's show, okay? I didn't know, uh, you know, so-and-so and and -and so-and-so did that. Information is power. One of the things that has held our community back, both men and women, by the time we get the information, it's black history. It's not current yeah. even. Okay, it's old, gone, done, contract gone, money gone. Okay, information is power. When we get the information in advance, we have enough time to figure it out. We always make the right decision to come out on top. Yeah, we get the opportunity to prepare. Absolutely. And there's so many things we don't get the opportunity to prepare for. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, um, what impact would you like to make, Ms. Hughes, as an African-American woman in business over the next 10 years? Oh, wow. <laughs> what, impact, what impact would be that hopefully uh, in, in 10 more years I will be – to a point where I can just spend my days volunteering and helping other individuals without uh, it being attached to to an entrepreneurial um, venture. I I love um, working with women who are homeless. So many of them have jobs but cannot afford to keep a roof over their heads. And uh, I would like to be able to just spend my time and the blessings that God has shared with me in terms of talents and expertise um, free of charge to uh, those who might find themselves in need of it. So I'm hopeful that the impact that I will have will be because I've had the opportunity to step outside of that which I have uh, built in terms of business and be in total philanthropic um, mode and mood and um, uh, use uh, for the fourth quarter of my life those skills to benefit others who uh, would not otherwise have the opportunity. Another phase of service. Another phase of service, absolutely. Very nice. So do you have a suggestion for black women in business on how to approach or seek a mentor? Uh, No. Because, as I said, they got them. They just uh, have to. I guess my advice would be you need to open your eyes and realize what you're looking at. Okay? Look at your aunt. Look at your mother. Look at your grandmother. Look at your next-door neighbor. Look at your teacher. 
Look at the choir director at church. Look at the women who are in front of you that that may not be, you know, the chairman um, uh, of a, a corporation, chairperson of a corporation, but still are employing skills at a level that uh, are transferable into any type of entrepreneurial uh, venture. Recognize what's right in front of you would be my advice. Okay. And can you share five success tips for us from you? Yes. My five success tips are believe, 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 believe. You have to believe first and foremost in God. You have to believe first and uh, second and foremost in yourself and realize that God resides in you. You have to thirdly believe that you can achieve whatever entrepreneurial venture that you set your heart to. You have to believe that other individuals will be there for you, will assist you, will propel you. And you have to believe that you will be successful. You have to see it in your mind's eye. You got to feel it. You got to, cannot doubt it. So my five tips for success are believe, 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 believe in those five different categories. Wonderful. Powerful. Can you recommend two books that you feel uh, every woman should read? Well, I don't know that every woman should read them. The last two books that I just uh, completed that I enjoyed very much, very inspirational, one was Shonda Rhimes' The Year of Yes. And then Russell Simmons also has a new book, um, Success Through Silence. It's about meditation and how if you calm yourself, there's nothing you can't figure out. So Russell Simmons' new book, uh, Success Through Silence, and Shonda Rhimes' is The Year of Yes. Wonderful. And Ms. Hughes, thank you sincerely for taking the time to give back and share your journey as a black woman in business. Is there one last nugget you might want to share? Yes, do just like Lisa Williams is doing and spread the word. Information is power. If you know about an accomplishment that's taking place within our very vast global community now, Share the information. It's easy to gossip about who's dating who or who, you know, lost what. It's more important and for some reason more challenging for us to spread the good news. So the nugget I'd like to leave with the Lisa Williams audience is, you know about a sister who's in business? Tell people. Spread the word. Wonderful. Where can our listeners get more information about you and, and Radio One? On the Internet. Okay. All right. And thank you for joining the show today. And everyone, remember, lead with value and the revenue will follow. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.